Welcome to this special market episode of FieldLink. I'm your host, Bill Smith. On this special commodity report, we catch up with Jody Lawrence from the Strategic Trading Advisors in Nashville as we dive into the August 12th WASDE report. In this special episode, we'll break down the world agriculture supply and demand estimates from the USDA for key commodities that will impact your farming operation for 2024 and beyond. Stay tuned for this special episode of FieldLink. This special report is being brought to you by Research. Protect your fall fertility investment today so your crop can benefit next spring. Ask your Helena representative how Research can fit into your fall fertility program. And welcome back for this special edition of FieldLink as we focus on the recent WASDE report. Uh, we've got Jody Lawrence joining us here from Nashville uh, with Strategic Trading Partners. Jody, welcome to FieldLink. Well, thank you, Bill. It's good to be back with the special report. I wish the USDA, which is a little more special than what they released, but it told us what a lot of what we know is that the U.S. is on pace to produce record crops this year. And that has never been considered a negative uh, until you start to look at some else what's going on in the world and the production that is, is available now. Because certainly when you have too much of something, you end up with the prices going down until you can sell it. So we're going to have to work through that for a little while. And Jody, you know, this report specifically really highlights that agriculture has absolutely transitioned into a global market. And it really does come out loud and clear when you look at this WASDE report here, the August report here, 24, specifically around soybeans. And we take a look at what some of the predictions are in soybeans. Bill, you're exactly right, because if you really, and just take it down to let's look where our competitors are in the world, we know that Russia is the number one wheat producer. We know that, and when I say Russia, Russia, Ukraine, Black Sea area, uh, and we know that Brazil, and when I say Brazil, Brazil and Argentina are the number one bean producers uh, in the world, while the U.S. still leads by a large margin in corn. So those are the three major producers uh, across the world in anything. And this year, which is really kind of unprecedented, it's been, I think, 13, 14 years since this has happened. But in the last 12 months, with the U.S. heading towards the end of their growing season, you had record Uh, wheat production out of the Black Sea. You had record bean production out of South America, and you're going to have record corn production out of the United States. And that shows what a great job the agriculture industry is doing to be able to continually maximize and increase yields year over year when weather becomes less than ideal in some places, certainly Brazil and Argentina didn't see perfect growing seasons. But you look at that and it's, you know, it's a testament to how intelligent and how strong and how hardworking everybody in our industry is that we're talking about consecutive record corn yields in the U.S. and a new potential bean yield this year, record bean yield, and uh, you, you have to pat everybody on the back because that's what everybody's in the industry for. But the problem is that we do end up with some lower prices that we have to work through to make everybody's bottom line look a little bit better. You know, I think you bring up a wonderful point there, uh, Jody, when we talk about how the global agriculture community has stepped up, whether it be, as you mentioned, wheat producers in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, soybean producers in South America, and of course, corn growers in the U.S. And it wasn't that long ago when we were sitting in conferences, you know, five, 10 years ago, we we're saying, how are we going to feed all these people around the world? And we're starting to show here through this WASI report that we've got a lot of supply. We've got a lot of grain to feed the mouths of, of hungry people around the world. And uh, going to tr- 
in a good direction in a lot of ways. Now, now we need to, the economics to step up a little bit and try to match some of that demand. And we're starting to see some of that. Uh, but, uh, Jody, let's talk a little bit about some strategy uh, as growers take a look at this report. Since we talked about soybeans, let's talk about soybeans. You know, what are some things growers need to think about? Well, the market where everything sets right now, and I know nobody is thrilled with where prices are, especially with beans, you know, down another 10 to 15 cents today. But if you go out and look at what you can do this year, and this is a specific new crop strategy, there is a lot of carry in the market. If you are just, and if you have bin space and to put in your crop, the difference between delivering it in the fall and waiting until March or April, you're pushing out to 50 cents now. So 50 cents and if you're using your bins, using them right, that's one of those things we're just going to have to find all of the areas to be able to maximize the price for this. And the same applies to corn. And the market in the carry is paying you more than what you would typically be charged by your elevator, a good bit more. So that tells you that we are in an ample stock situation with both corn and beans, but you also need to look at, okay, where are my opportunities? What could I be waiting for? And the best thing that's available out there right now, unfortunately, is the fact that the market is asking you to hold on to those bushels until early 2025, and you'll be rewarded for it, but we also are going to have to get some rallies in this to sell into so everybody feels a little more comfortable. It's uh, it's hard to be patient and preach patience for rallies because everybody in the ag community is always optimistic. Since early June or really late May, prices have done nothing but go down, which has frustrated everybody. And it's it's one of these things that sometimes you just have to realize that we may be getting into a situation, Bill, that we just talked about. If everybody around the world is can produce record bushels because we have so many acres in play and coming out of a, a slowing economic period around the world, and certainly China's economy has been hit harder than most, we're, we're just in one of those 12-month cycles where we outproduced the demand that's out there. So you have to look at ways and the way in that is is trying to capture some carry in the market right now. Yeah, I, I think you made an excellent point there. You know, carrying is certainly an option. There are some other factors that, you know, could really impact, you know, there's some projections of, you know, some different crush plants coming online here in the United States uh, over the next several months that, you know, that, that might increase the demand, especially if beans are kind of sitting where they're at, uh, for some alternative uses uh, that, you know, we haven't had the luxury of utilizing. Plus, you, you know, the, the 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 quiet group there, and you touched on it, was China. The demand, as they kind of get their feet underneath them, the demand for soybeans are definitely going to be there. The question becomes, will will the United States be the winner or will Brazil be the winner in, in that negotiating war? And, and, and that's an impossible question to answer. We certainly know that the momentum is on Brazil's side. And this has been decades long policy from the U.S. that China intentionally has supported Brazil's agriculture. And this is not a Republican or a Democrat. And it certainly is unlikely to change in November's election that our relationship with China is at best strained and uh, when they when they absolutely have to have beans or corn is when they feel like the U.S. is selling them uh, a, a higher quality product at a discount like we've seen lately. So we do need China. A better relationship with them would go a long way. We have to get some of these issues that have popped up in the SAF, the sustainable aviation fuel industry, because you've got blending facilities being able to import, use cooking oil from China and Southeast Asia and use that instead of domestic bean oil. Mm -hmm. And for some reason during all this legislation and the way everything was going, and then the appeals court even ruled in favor of the refineries to do it, that somehow that loophole was not shut because basically a, a lot of 
domestic demand could be solved if we simply internalized a lot of uh, all of the sustainable aviation uh, fuel push that's going forward. And I think to a lot of people in the industry, it's stunning that those loopholes weren't long since addressed, considering the fact that tens, if not fifties of billions of dollars have already been spent on these new crush facilities or certainly in the planning. So uh, there, you know, there are always political issues, it seems like. Sure. Uh, I, I've never heard at, at a meeting or in a barroom conversation, oh gosh, I love our U.S. government. They treat me so fairly as a farmer. And it's, uh, you know, it's not, it's not just a perception because you look at some of the things going on and we need our elected officials from the ag states to put agriculture first in front of everybody so that I think, you know, a new farm bill can get passed because it looks like that's going to be kicked, you know, deep into the new administration, whoever the new uh, administration is or next administration, say, say it that way, uh, in 25. So I would love to see us tighten up our own house. Uh, politically, as far as farm, farm policy, export policy, and domestic use are uh, handled. And then I think everybody uh, can feel better that the U.S. government and the USDA are uh, looking out for every farmer's best interest, not just, just not when it's popular. Yeah, it's uh, certainly uh, a, a, a wild time here the next uh, roughly 90 days before the election. And uh, a lot of questions hanging around that farm bill right now, uh, whether something could and potentially happen. Doesn't look too bright right now, but probably going to move into, as you mentioned, the next administration at some point. Jody, let's move on and pivot from soybeans to other commodities. Let's What what did the Ruazdu report talk about as it relates to corn? Well, the big thing is that the corn yield, uh, they are estimating that the U.S. can produce a 183.1 record yield corn crop this year. The industry was projecting uh, averaged out to a 182, basically, and trend was at 181. And really the impressive thing about this as you look forward on corn is that we are putting together the ability, we're going to add over five bushels an acre to last year's record. And I spoke last week and with the Olympics going on, think about it this way. We loved watching the swimming and you look at somebody, uh, you know, a uh, greatest of all time, like Katie Ledecky, how far ahead she was of everybody in the pool. They had to get a wide angle shot just to find the next person. This year is Katie Ledecky lapping Katie Ledecky, basically, yeah. when you talk about corn yield, it's it's an amazing and impressive feat. And when you go down, you know, bean yields at 53.2, that's going to be a record. You look at total crop. But the interesting thing about this is that even with these records, and this kind of highlights that you know, we're not going back to $6 corn anytime soon, but you take off 250 million bushels and which is not much, whether it's through demand, whether the yield falls a little bit into the January report. It, it, these markets are still operating on a razor margin when you look at corn stocks around the world. And we produced a, just barely over a 15 billion bushel crop of 15.112. And we're going to use right at 15 billion bushels of it. So the margin for error is so small. Uh, that this year's record is temporarily hurting prices, but the odds of continuing to add three, four bushels every year after year, uh, while they're there, they're incredibly small. And we, you know, uh, it, it, it's just an impressive accomplishment that I don't want to diminish that because I want everybody to look at the accomplishment rather than the side effect and the side effects lower prices right now, and it will just have to work through that. Let's 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 move on to uh, you know we talk corn, we talk beans. How about a couple other commodities while we got you on today? How about wheat and rice? Uh, what's going on in those areas based on reports? Well, wheat has uh, it, it, it really has a bullish story because you look at several different things. There was some 
uh, some crop loss uh, towards the end of the black sea growing season. There was some uh, wheat loss in Argentina. The U.S., planted more beans at the expense of apparently spring wheat acres this year, uh, is what we found out today. Wheat has got a nice bullish story moving forward that as the global stocks continue to tighten, these pretty soon harvest pressure is going to come out of wheat. Wheat could easily see 30, 40 uh, cent bounce, which would help corn to pull. So I'm out of the three, I'm most optimistic about what we could do heading into the end of the year. We just have to get all of the northern hemisphere winter wheat and then the early spring wheat harvest out of the way because there's always harvest pressure in, in wheat. But rice, I, did, I, I didn't have enough time to really look at those numbers today, but I, I do know it's very difficult for rice to make much of a run if corn is trading below four dollars so there's just pressure Uh, i I always lump rice in with a grain it just because the way it 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 has to trade so closely with those that uh, we've got an oversupply that needs to be eaten through and corn is the bell cow in this and it will uh, you know, unfortunately, kind of bleed down into the other markets, uh, rice being one of them. So, Jody, when we step back, uh, based on looking at this report and getting a good picture, kind of frame it up for us what, from an ending stock standpoint. What, what's your thoughts there? The U.S. next year, and this is for the 24-25 U.S. ending stocks, corn is at 2.07 billion bushels. And this is the first year since 20, since 20 that this corn stocks has been over 2 billion bushels. And it actually was lower than expected because the U.S. found some lost acreage and added some demand to a couple different columns. But that that's really the big number. The bean number is almost twice what it was uh, two years ago and a, a full 60% bigger than last year. And corn was up roughly 10% from last year. So we're adding bushels, but when you look at a percentage of it, the bushels that we're adding to ending stocks are such a small percentage of the total crop. We added, let's just call it 200 million bushels out of a 15 billion bushel crop. So that's less than one and a half percent if you know, it sounds like a U.S. savings rate that if we only (laughs) saved one and a half percent of all of our paychecks, you know, our emergency fund wouldn't be very big. It'd be pretty thin, wouldn't it? (laughs) Yeah. And that's kind of the way I look at this is we're really, we're 250 million bushels from certainly not $6 corn or, you know, uh, beans going back to 12, 13, but our margin for error here is smaller then I think uh, everybody realizes when times are bad and, you know, a million acres here, a million acres there, a couple bushels towards the end of the year. And South America says, wow, we can't make any money. So we're not expanding Mm -hmm. uh, acres this year. There's some interesting cross currents moving forward in the next three months that, uh, you know, my hope always is now that we've posted the number, we're looking for better prices from here. Uh, you know, we want better prices from here forward. And the only way to do that is if the yield was a little bit overstated by the USDA. I think that's a great lead in here because as you said earlier, you know, you step by, hey, okay, you know, Eastern Europe had a great wheat crop, South America, wonderful soybean crop. We're, we're boy, ba- based on my travels across uh, much of the U.S. here in the last several weeks and, and talking to agronomists and sales reps from across the country, it looks like we're going to have, across the board, a really, really good corn and soybean crop. Uh, so, so you know, all those boxes are checked, but there's still some uncertainty there. Even even with all this looking good, to your point, the carry, uh, the ending stocks, we're tight. It's going to be tight from a global perspective. And there's some factors that certainly could impact us beyond, beyond our current supply. Uh, one being... Uh, Heck, we've got an election coming up. That's could, you know, potentially change some attitudes out there. But but just recently, oil 
energy. Uh, there's a lot happening still uh, over in Iran right now, uh, attacking Israel. So that's certainly going to have an impact potentially. Yeah, at one point today, crude oil was back up over at least testing eighty dollars a barrel and up three dollars because over the weekend, as those tensions continue to escalate, we're uh, you know we're to a point where the uh, all the foreign policy people are talking about there very easily could be a full on Middle East war with Iran promising retaliation for killing the Hamas leader to Israel. Uh, and, uh, you know, a full scale war between Israel and Iran that brings in obviously higher fuel costs, but it brings in really great margins for all of the uh, uh, ethanol facilities to grind that corn. So there's some things and you hate to say, wow, we need a war for X to happen for price to go up because the world doesn't need that, nor do we want it. But there's some things out there. And this is why I've sounded like a uh, broken record about on these dips, keep buying your diesel. Because if this escalates, we've saw this before in the Gulf War. Gosh, when was that in the 90? Uh, first evasion of Kuwait and just the different times when the markets get shocked that it, it wouldn't surprise me at all uh, it, if because the, the big picture in the worry is if that bleeds over, then the next thing you know, uh, some of those other Middle Eastern countries get involved in it. You've got you've got a wider spread conflict that you know we've seen crude at a hundred dollars a barrel within the last eighteen months, and it wouldn't shock anybody for it to go back there. Well, and, and in addition to the energy side of things, if if we do have an all out war in in, in that region. You know, that's certainly going to impact logistics as well. Shipping, you know, that wheat from Eastern Europe has to move through, you know, certain areas down there uh, of that part of the world through the Mediterranean to get to get to export it to different parts of the country. So we're back to where we're at. You know, this tight global supply could really, you know, show its ugly face at that point. Last Friday with or excuse me, last Monday, when Bank of Japan decided to raise rates, just the financial chaos of one small action mm-hmm. that interfered with, and at one point, you know, the Dow over the course of a couple of days was down 2,000 points, was down 5%, and other markets, NASDAQ even more so. But you look at these little events that are always out there, but it now that we've gotten down here, you're almost on the side of what's the bullish catalyst because we've priced in so much bad news everywhere mm-hmm. at sub four dollar corn and mid nine beans. Right. Where are those things? And we've already talked about a couple of them today. And you know, it just it just big picture is uh, always the adage. Adage is always correct because we we saw it over the last two years. High prices cure high prices and low prices cured low prices. So uh, we're just in the cycle of it. Uh, unfortunately, we're in, the in, we're in an industry that we hurt ourselves for doing a fantastic job. And it's part of a cycle through uh, you know, 24 and at least early 25, we're going to have to uh, figure out a way to get to the other side. You bet. And, you know, throw on top of that, hey, we're not out of the storm yet. Yes, it's August. Weather across the country looks pretty good. But you know what? There's a hurricane season's upon us. Uh, That could impact some crops in the southeast and uh, throughout that Atlantic coast. Uh, yeah, you'd, you're always looking at uh, odd things like that that could come in. And, it, you know, when you talk about hurricanes, you think about more about the Delta in the southeast state. So you could look at something, you know, if it runs it, it, heading into all of the Gulf of Mexico bordering states, that something like that could have a big impact uh, on the cotton crop. Got, cotton was up a little bit today. The numbers you can't really take. Uh, as bullish or bearish because cotton has been in its own slide for the same factors, everything else, too much supply, not enough demand. Uh, But you, you look at a storm like that. And if you throw in a Middle East war and a big, uh, you don't need a Katrina hurricane event, certainly. But if you, you shut down, you have to evacuate all of 
uh, the oil rigs for, you know, three or four days, a couple more times this summer, you, you really have some, you know, crazy things that could develop and you don't have to connect too many dots to get there. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's just, it could be a handful of little things that creep up and, uh, you know, change this game really quickly overnight. So, Jody, want to thank you for joining us from Nashville for this special commodity update report as we cover the August report from the USDA WASDE. Jody, thanks for joining us on this special episode of Fieldlink. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for joining us on this episode of FieldLink, brought to you by Research. Energize your soil and elevate your crop for next season by incorporating Research into your fertility program. Contact your Helena representative to learn more about Research.